The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, uh, so the um, take-home exam uh, it should be released uh, by the end of this lecture. And uh, I hope we will be fine problems. I spend uh, the weekend trying to make up the problem. In addition, writing five letters and write a report. Uh, but see, uh, um, so making problems is always uh, int uh, difficult, but also interesting. So. I was talking to Jonathan. Hopefully, he'll write a paper based on these problems. <laughs> OK. Um, now, coming back to uh, what we were talking uh, in the last lecture, uh, we were discussing really the now uh, chapter 8. The title is the coupled transport and energy conversion. And uh, uh, my view here is uh, uh, when we think about the energy conversion, it's microscopically, it's one form of the energy carrier transform the energy into the other form. And, uh, uh, and that, transfer, that the coupling process uh, is the, what we, when we use Boltzmann equation, is reflected in the scattering term. And in this scattering term, we have a scattering rate, uh, which approximately in the perturbation limit, uh, we can use the Fermi Golden Rule to calculate that scattering rate. So we took uh, electron phonon coupling as an example. We say, OK, if I have the phonon lattice vibrate and change the separation between the atoms, and that's effectively changing the periodicity of that the electron interference, and that's the deformation potential. And with the deformation potential, we actually uh, went through the uh, derivation right down the uh, Fermi Golden Rule and say, what's that the scatter matrix look like? And from that, that we say that actually gives the lateral Fermi Golden Rule, and in the manipulation of scatter matrix, naturally give you the energy and the momentum conservation. And then we move down to say, OK, if I plug in the scattering rate, which is typically coupling two different particles, into the scattering term, which has to include all the possible collisions, all the possible scattering. And uh, of course, we know this scattering term is very complicated. But at the end of last lecture, I said uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, very often presented in books in, say, uh, solid physics or electric uh, electronics. If you split this F into a uh, first or zero order, which a even term and the R term, and using that because any function can always have a even and R term, right? Summation, uh, any function is split into a even R term a summation. And they plug in back into the scattering integral. You find out uh, that this uh, uh, split led to actually, in the case of uh, example we discussed in electron phonon, uh, led to two terms uh, in the scattering. And one of the term is approximately you can use the relaxation approximation. And it turns out the physics or physically this term is the elastic scattering. It's a process where there's no, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, for example, when electron phonons scatter, there's no energy change, it's just a direction change. Okay. Or the, the other term is the inelastic scattering, and it turns out the inelastic scattering term, you cannot, rigorously speaking, you cannot use relaxation time approximation. So um, just uh, don't be surprised that if you write a paper, you use the Boltzmann equation, and at the end, uh, say, uh, uh, people at relaxation time say, I thought that's not valid. In fact, we had that, that experience. That's, uh, say, a reviewer say, the Boltzmann equation is not valid uh, for 
in the last guest gathering process. So this is where it came from. Okay, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, so uh, the point that I'm going to make next is there are different process. You can write the similar expressions start of words along the same approach, Fermi Golden Rule. You can calculate the scattering matrix. That's the interaction. That's the um, uh, say, uh, for example, if we have semiconductor, a light comes in, and that can interact, uh, excite the electron, lift the electron from valence band to the conduction band, and uh, uh, we have H nu here, and that process uh, you can describe using Fermi Golden Rule. That's the absorption scale, uh, process. So you can calculate the absorption. Fundamentally, you can calculate the absorption coefficient of a material using this approach. And uh, uh, um, now, once I have the uh, uh, electron lifted, create a hole, and the electron uh, hole in the valence band, and electron in the conduction band, and if you look at uh, can I get it, right? Yeah, I want a solar shell. I want to make a solar shell. And uh, the energy of the electron hole are here. And they, of course, you want to take this energy out to the electrode. Then it's a competition rate process. Because if I think about here, right, I have electron and I have a hole. It turns out there are different possibilities. Uh, and of course, uh, in the solar shell, what happens is so you create a gradient of this charge carrier, and they will diffuse towards the electrode. But that takes time, right? Any, uh, say, so it takes time to, for this diffusion to happen. And in the process, the excess energy of the electron, because the electron phonon scattering, that's the one that we treated. You can go to, for example, plug in typical numbers. And the electron phonon scattering is very fast. So the, it's hard to actually get the energy out directly, and they were relaxed to the bottom. And uh, this is a, if you can extract uh, this electron energy before they relax to the bottom, there's some idea people tried in the past. A lot of people read it, this is a hot electron. Right? The electron is still hot. And uh, if you can extract them, those are hot electron cells. People are reading in the 70s. Nobody has really realized conceptually it's possible. Nobody has really realized and the benefit of the solar cell. So similarly, the holes will relax, right? And once they got here, then you have the possibility. So the electron and the hole will recombine and give off the energy. Uh, and then you can have two recombination process. So one is the emitter H nu. This is radiative. So radiative recombination, right? And the other possibility is actually give out a lot of phonons, right? Again, this is H omega, just to say. It's still H nu, but the phonon vibrational energy is much smaller, right? So the band gap energy is usually larger. So this typically will involve multi-phonon, right? Multiple phonon processes. So uh, this is a long reading here. Okay, so you have a, a, a radio to long radio recombination, and of course, uh, if you say you want to make a laser, for example, you want the radio recombination. You don't want to lose those. Uh, you want to extract the energy at the photons. Right. It turns out that even if you want to make a solar cell, as we will talk today, you want this radio recombination other than non radio recombination. And, uh, uh, but this, even this is not all representative of all the possibilities. One other possibility is that now I have an uh, electron here, I have a hole here, and they interact. Of course, they will release their energy. And uh, in this process, they don't release to photon. They don't release to phonon. They give their energy to less labor electron. 
And so what they happen is this energy is kick the electron here uh, to a higher energy state. OK. And again, you know you don't like this one. Because once the energy, this electron gets to a higher energy state, you will relax quickly back. So that excess energy is lost again to the phonon because of this process, right? And unless you can, like I said, extract the hot electron out. And this is the OJ process, OJ recombination. So there are uh, uh, all those processes in theory you can go to describe using the quantum mechanical scattering matrix method and write it down and, and uh, say uh, calculate the scattering rate. So if I uh, write the uh, Boltzmann equation, uh, say so this scattering term is a lot more complex, right? So before we just use the um, uh, say uh, relaxation time approximation, and now you can say I have really, for example, I can have uh, scattering really electron phonon, right? This could be electron phonon scattering. I could also have uh, say generation, right? If I have photon comes in, that will generate electron hole pairs. Depends on what carrier you are say considering, and uh, uh, then I have recombination, radiative or, rec or long radiative, all those are possible. And this is on the right hand side of the Boltzmann equation, right? On the left hand side is the transport, is the diffusion and uh, the moving under electric field, right? So. At the end, uh, I have a coupling of the energy conversion. You can think that the right hand side, uh, right hand side of Boltzmann equation, and uh, the transport is on the left hand side of the equation. And there is the competition uh, if you want to extract the useful energy out to the electrode. So, uh, uh, just in terms of uh, terminology, a little bit sidetrack. Uh, one terminology, if you do uh, solar cells, you do lasers, uh, one terminology that's used often is called quantum efficiency. So what does quantum efficiency mean? So just uh, as definition. And this are uh, all engineering language at the end, because uh, to do this calculation, you can see already it's very much very involved, right? So, uh, uh, say the quantum efficiency is depends on what uh, I'm making, whether I'm making a laser or solar cell, right? So, if I'm making, for example, a uh, laser, what I want, if I make a laser, for example, I want photons, right? And uh, I inject a current, which means I inject the electron hole pairs, right? And uh, one pair of electron hole I inject into the device in theory perfectly. What do you want? You want to get a one e photon out, right? So this is the quantum efficiency is uh, the number of photon you get versus the number of electron hole you inject, right? And uh, this is a laser, or uh, uh, say LED. Now if you use a solar cell, it's a reverse, right? You have one photon comes in, you want to extract one pair of electron holes. And uh, so, uh, one electron hole pair and one photon. So this is a solar cell, right? And this is a quantum efficiency. Then you read the literature, sometimes people say, what's the external quantum efficiency? What's the internal quantum efficiency? Right? So you have external. 
you have internal quantum efficiency. And what you're talking about is, say, for example, uh, you, when you make a device, make a solar cell, you have an electrode, right? What can actually be going to the electrode, that's uh, externally. But how many electron hole pairs, steady state that you have inside, right? The device, that's an internal. So you have the difference between internal and external quantum efficiency. And people use those to characterize uh, uh, how effective, because uh, say normally we think one pair of, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, electron hole will generate one pair of photon or vice versa. However, recently, if you read literature, there are some people saying, I have quantum efficiency larger than one. What does that mean? Right? So this is the way you think about that you want to make, uh, let's suppose I have band gap here, right? And uh, I have very high energy photon comes in. Okay? And very high energy photon, so this is an electron, this is a hole, and generate, the, say, high energy electron and a hole in the band. And if you're lucky, right, these are all the different ray process, this electron, when it relaxes down, it does not interact with the photon. It will actually give the excess, uh, say, uh, energy to lift another electron out of the valence band to the conduction band. Right. Of course, that means that this energy, electron energy has to be larger than the band gap. Otherwise, that's impossible. Right. And that's multi-carrier, multiple. So one fo in this case, effectively, one photon comes in. It generates more than one electron hole pairs. And uh, uh, in, of course, uh, you would love to have that in when you try to make a solar cell. Because that's the uh, um, people to call this multi-exciton generation. Okay, and here you can say you have to compete against the different rate, right? Otherwise, they, if they fall on, suck the energy away, and uh, you can't have that multi-exciton. Whether that happens, there are a lot of fight in the uh, scientific community, because some people claim they have seen very high uh, multi-exciton generations, so, while well, other people, I just ran Professor Mungji Bawendi, and uh, he was involved in this debate on whether the multi-exciton generation is indeed happening or not. OK, so uh, that's, uh, say, just the some side track, uh, track in terms of definitions. But say, coming back to the Boltzmann equation, right? Now, say, uh, we said that on the right-hand side, you can have multiple terms. On the left-hand side is our standard, uh, say, diffusion drift or see in the case of uh, no size effect, and when there's size effect, I have to do pass integral as we solve this uh, Boltzmann equation, right? So what I'm going to introduce are different forms. And uh, if I talk about electron, right? So for example, when you have a metal, and you have laser comes in, very fast laser, and uh, what happens, uh, the laser energy is, uh, in the case of a photon comes into a metal, is used to lift the energy of the electron. It's the electron absorption, right? So that's the first step of the interaction. And uh, once the energy of the electron is lifted to very high temperature, you can see this is a really, even electron itself is a long equilibrium process, right? Because of the laser frequency is fixed. And if I think about uh, typical electronic uh, right, uh, energy level, this is a Fermi level, this is a band. And uh, an electron can be lifted to a very high energy. And, but say, uh, it's uh, not even in equilibrium with itself. However, electron-electron interaction itself is very fast. Because that's a Coulomb interaction. It's a force, right? It's a speed of light and uh, an electric field. So uh, uh, say 
electrons themselves critically get thermalized with each other. So effectively, you can say electron has an effective temperature. That's an approximation, right? And in fact, in literature, there are debate whether electron, how fast it is to get a uniform temperature between electrons. Let's suppose if you use that electron temperature, right? So you have electron temperature, and they are not the same as the phonon temperature. And that's where we have, right? electron phonon interaction, and uh, at the same time, they transfer, right? So if you go to start from the Boltzmann equation, writing these two terms, and then you manipulate the equation, and this is a similar when you read chapter six, and when we, uh, I, I didn't go through, you could do the, I said that you can derive conservation equations, right? So you can, go through that process and what will happen, what you get is some uh, equations like uh, uh, you can write the, the electron temperature, this is a model that you can derive from Boltzmann equation with a lot of assumptions, okay, again. So, and uh, what, uh, say so here, I have the standard diffusion equation, right? This is the Fourier law for electron diffusion and uh, uh, and then say I have now the electron coupled to phonon Te minus Tp, and that's the electron phonon coupling. So it's like a, say a convection, right? Say electron phonon temperature difference times that G is like effective heat transfer coefficient between electron and phonons. And uh, similarly, you can write the equation Tp and dTp dt equals delta and kp delta tp and plus g t minus tp. So one is losing energy, the other system is uh, gaining energy. The full line is gaining energy, so you have two different temperatures, and this is called, uh, say, um, two temperature model, right? So you have electron is at its own equilibrium, local equilibrium, and full line is that a different? And uh, uh, in fact, uh, in lot of those, uh, for example, pump and probe experiment, you can clearly say a uh, typical signal when you do a pump probe. Basically, you have laser, very fast laser comes in, and the reflectance is a measure of the electron temperature. And uh, in those kind of signal, you say, okay, your first uh, time pulse comes in, and the temperature change. And in this region, that's the hot electron region. And you can clearly see that in the experiment. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, and for for this region, in fact, uh, using this model is reasonable. You can solve the uh, two temperature model and describe the uh, electron and phonon temperature. But this is a case of metal. What if I have a semiconductor? Right. So, uh, uh, okay, one more comment for this, in fact, because uh, I uh, like to think about Boltzmann equation. No, I have not found anybody solving Boltzmann equation for electrons, that's one. And second, I have not found, say, uh, this equation neglected thermoelectric transport, right? If you look at it, here is the specific heat, so internal energy, and this is the heat conduction. And then when we do charge, we know there is a thermoelectric term, right? Uh, uh, the Peltier term that carries heat. So in theory, you should be writing a modified equation. And, uh, 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 and uh, say, even for the diffusion term, there should be a modified term. Uh, this is a diffusion. Both are the diffusion, right? And then you say ballistic. That's a lot more complicated. So you say even those kind of problems, uh, it's not fully answered. Now, if you go to look at uh, the next, I say you have to know what you deal with. You, if I give you a piece of metal to do the experiment versus I give you a piece of semiconductor to do the experiment, right? So if I have a piece of semiconductor, what happens, right? And uh, uh, here I have light comes in and uh, um, Semiconductor is more complicated. 
because uh, when my light is above the band gap, right? This is a this is a uh, uh, electron in the hole, right? So my you can say the first step is I will heat up generate electron hole pairs. An electron hole pair quickly cool down, so to the bottom of the conduction band span. And then they will recombine. That process could be much smaller. This cooling down is a peak of second. Recombination in different semiconductor in gallium arsenide, which is direct gap, is the farthest. Could be nanosecond. So that's already two or three order magnitude different. And if you deal with a very good silicon, with uh, say, um, uh, because silicon is an indirect gap, right? You need phonons to have that process happening. So it's much slower. So the recombination in good silicon could be as long as a second. Okay? Very long process. So what happens? Now you say, okay, I will have exponential decay absorption coefficient. Right? That's what the profile of electron hole generation. That's what the absorption. But uh, if you're naive, you say, OK, if I don't know this, this absorption, when I do a heat transfer, I would use that as my heat source. Right? Say, I say, this is my heat source distribution, which is actually not true if you think about what's the physics involved. What is this absorption just say, I'm generating that electron hole pair distribution. And now electron hole pair has, uh, say, the excess energy, this part of energy, right, because it happens very fast, picosecond. So I can say, OK, immediately this part of energy, the profile is very similar. So I can say those part of energy is generated at this exponential decay. And similarly, on the whole side, you have this, right? But then there is also the other part across the gap. It's not released because there is a, a, the, it takes time for that recombination. And also I have to be careful that recombination, whether it's radiative or it's non-radiative. Right? It's, it's non-radiative, it generate the photons. If it's radiative, it generate another photon. That propagate again, it's get reabsorbed again in the material. Right? You see there? Okay, so uh, for so for this part, that's easy because uh, uh, essentially you can use the time, right? The uh, what we can write is if I have uh, diffusion, right? I'm concerned because I generate a gradient of electron hole pairs, and they will diffuse into the material, and the uh, you can write the diffusion equation. And I, let me just do a steady state. Again, you can make, a, a, depends on your experiment, depends on what you're doing. So I'm going to write a diffusion equation, diffusivity of this electron O, the concentration gradient, right? Let's suppose this is the x, OK? And for this recombination term here, and uh, very often, this can be written as a relaxation time term in the Boltzmann equation. And this is recombination time, the rate of recombination. Okay. And uh, you can say it includes both radiative or long radiative. You can distinguish them if you want. But I, I'm just going to just to say I'm going to write this as n minus n0 tau equals zero. So what happens is the carrier, carriers generated will diffuse and they recombine. Right? It's uh, happening at the same time. And uh, if this recombination is long rated here, it will generate a trail of uh, heat source that's different from the exponential absorption profile. Right? And uh, so, uh, uh, so this diffusion, so the diffusion lens, right, how fast this is spread out, then you can say this is a standard diffusion equation. 
is the diffusivity times time. Okay, and the diffusivity. If I take a silicon as example, and this diffusivity of silicon, diffusivity, you say I only remember it could be four, four order magnitude higher than thermal diffusivity. So that's what's in my mind. And now thermal diffusivity 10 to the minus 4 right, uh, centimeter square. Now, meter square. So wait. So uh, the thermal diffusivity of silicon is of the 10 to the minus 4 meter square per second. So diffusivity for electrons is of the uh, 1 meter square per second. Okay, four order magnitude higher. And the relaxation, say recombination time, right? If I do millisecond or second, microsecond, depends on the purity, very sensitive, depends on the purity of the materials, right? So I have people doing solar cell, I'll ask her, what's the recombination time of your silicon? Multi crystalline, 100 microseconds. Okay, 100 microseconds. 10 to the minus 4 second, right? If I do that, uh, d, the square root of d times tau, you can go to say how large is the diffusion of the charge, right? So you have the point I want to make is you have to know what are you doing in this kind of uh, each process, what's the detailed charge carrier transport process to even find out where, for example, when you care at the end, heat transfer. I always care heat transfer. You have to say where is the heat generated. OK? So uh, that's what I mean by coupled charge, uh, coupled, uh, say, conversion, uh, say, energy conversion. That's the right-hand side. And the left-hand side is the transport. And uh, let's look at uh, one specific example. And we're not going to uh, say uh, th this example is all you, uh, uh, you care about. Uh, let's look at solar cell. OK? But to do solar cell, I'll uh, first do p injunction. You have to understand that what is a pn junction, right? And uh, uh, I've uh, mentioned it many times on semiconductor in this course, and uh, not very systematic, I understand. But say, uh, the uh, basic uh, picture we have so far is I, of course, uh, here I'm drawing the band structure, right? But say, the, at the end, what matters is because uh, it's really near the bottom of conduction band on top of the valence band, right? Because the carrier quickly relaxed to that region. So typically, when we draw it, we actually just draw flat. You can draw a point, but the flat is just, this is my bottom conduction band, and this is the top of the valence band, right? And pin junction, so when I have an n-type material, my chemical potential is here, right? Because if you think about uh, Fermi Dirac distribution, the E minus mu, right? E minus mu, so this separation is much smaller than this E minus mu. So I have more electrons. What I draw is a lot of electron in the conduction band. That's an n-type material. And then, I'm drawing the same band gap because uh, I'm using the same band gap material. You can use a different band gap. That's a heterojunction. But here, so I have, this is the n-type. This is a p-type, right? They are standalone, not connected. Now, you connect them, you put them together, say, the mu, the chemical potential, is the driving force for mass diffusion or charge flow, right? 
chemical potential is the driving force for diffusion. When you, whenever you have a temperature, let's say, uh, 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 imbalance in the chemical potential, there is a particle flow. So when I collect them together, eventually, what that happened is this is still my binding back gap, right? Band gap, and uh, this is my mu. So I'm going to draw a uh, mu line here. And uh, uh, on this side, it's going to be my p type. On this side, is my n type. So I line the chemical potential first. And then you connect them. The conduction band together, valence band together. Right? And uh, uh, say approximate way to connect is a parabola. You can solve the Poisson equation to find out uh, the exact profile. And that's what, uh, say, a typical profile look like. OK, that's your PN junction at the equilibrium, right? So, and here we have, oh, I draw it too large, but that's fine. So what I have here is the difference between the conduction bands on the flat region far away from the interface. And this is a, a, say, EV built-in potential. So that depends on, you can say, you can actually do that exercise quickly because uh, away in this region, you still have your Boltzmann statistic or Fermi Dirac statistics. And on this side, so you, once you align, you can find out what has to be the conduction band edge offset. That depends on the doping of the two material. OK? And uh, uh, what, uh, what is physically happening, so this n type, I have a lot of, uh, so for the n type, right, I can draw this when I collect the two material. This is the interface of the two material. In the n type, for example, it's a phosphor, right? In silicon, it's phosphor. And it has five, ch five electrons. This free electron that get free is moving to the other side, right? So this is the n region. The electron is lost going to the other side. And what's left behind is the phosphor atom, right? The phosphor atom now doesn't have uh, electron to balance it anymore. So it's, a, it's a, say, actually a positive phosphor atom region. This are not a mobile, right? Those are just atoms sitting on the lattice, OK? And similarly, on the p-type side, right, it's boron doped. And boron get that electron. And so boron becomes negatively charged, right? So you have negative charge. Right, this are the space charge region. There's no mobile charge. It's atoms, positive charge atom, negative charge atom. Away from the junction, you have a neutral region where there's equal number of electrons and, let's say, the ions. But in this region, it's not neutral. Right? So this is the space charge region. OK, and uh, uh, this, uh, so, uh, so again, the, the weight of this depends on the dopant concentration. And if you have less dopant, the space charge region is wider. You have more dopant, the space charge region is narrow. And typical semiconductor with dopant is a few microns in the space charge region. OK. And, uh, uh, <coughs> So now that's the uh, uh, steady state, right? And uh, say a dial, say a pin junction is a diode. We know that uh, say it's uh, uh, anisotropic, right? And uh, if I do a, a, say a forward bias, what do I mean? 
forward bias. I apply a voltage, right? And the voltage will change the electrochemical potential. So on these two sides, I have a difference now on electrochemical potential. Now, if I want to have a forward bias, should this going up or going down? Huh? OK, going up, right? So a forward bias means, OK, now I have chemical potential on the P side. And uh, electrochemical potential. Uh, OK, that's the end side. And here, you become flatter. That's a pin junction under forward bias, right? You have to be able to draw this is the N region, this is the P region, and this is a uh, you collect. So, so if you think about your collect a, a pin junction you, with a battery, right? Is this side you collect the negative side or positive side? Negative side, because when you draw, because I'm raising this potential is, uh, I'm raising the negative, becoming more higher there. So this is the uh, uh, if you collect. This is positive, right? I forgot. Right, that's what you collect. Okay, so uh, now I have uh, the uh, the. At least at the electrode, that's what it looks like, right? The question is how these two are going to connect to each other, right? So in the bulk of the pin junction, away from the space charge region, it's pretty much electron itself is uh, at equilibrium. So it's still very, so it's a diffusion, very small deviation uh, from uh, what the we have in this picture here, OK? But once you get to the space charge region, this equilibrium is broken. There's not holes to low enough uh, holes or electron to still keep the electron hole pretty much at the equilibrium with each other. So electron and the hole actually now each have equivalently a separate chemical potential. This is a quasi Fermi level, or say electrochemical potential. So, so the way to draw this, and this is where you have to say the, the invention of pin junction, right? I don't know whether I told this story before. It was a, uh, it was a Shockley, it was a Bardeen, it was a Brayden. Okay, it was the Bardeen. So Shockley was, I, if I recall correctly, this Shockley was the manager, and uh, uh, Bardeen and Braden did the physical lab invention of the pin junction. Okay, and Shockley know this is a very important, and he will be left out for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> he worked out the theory for this. Okay. Walk around to activate your sensor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Shockley got Nobel Prize for twice, right? Shockley got Nobel Prize twice. The other, so this is semiconductor, and he got the Nobel Prize uh, for BCS theory. What is that? That's a superconductivity. Uh, uh, say uh, is. Uh, 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 is Bardeen, Shockley, and uh, uh, Schrieffer. Okay. Cooper, BCS, where is the BC? Oh, Bardeen, wait, where? Oh, Bardeen got, got yeah, Bardeen got a low price twice. So, okay, now it, it class. So Shockley got it once. Okay, uh, but anyway, so, so there was an interesting recount 
of the invention of the uh, diode in the Bell Lab. So maybe I mixed up the people. But anyway, uh, uh, so my student uh, got a good, pri a good, 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 pro good result. I got to get a lab and get my fingers there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, where, where we are. So here is what happens. You have to think about, this is actually a very, very delicate picture. Electron is the conductor in the n-type. How that transition going into a p-type, going to holes, right? Holes are the conductor in the p-type. It's not an easy picture. And the theory that was thought out and, and you can go to solve the, in fact, uh, that's the equation we have here is a carrier diffusion equation. And uh, so what happens is in the space charge region, they uh, say this, say I pretty much draw flat because the resistance in each region is pretty small. So resistance will determine this quasi Fermi level, if you think about Ohm's law, that's a voltage drop. If the resistance is small, it's pretty flat. Okay. So once you get over, so this is the junction there, get over to the T side, and in fact, uh, get out of the space charge region. Okay. And then see, this is a steel electron here, right? Electron come over to here. And, uh, uh, um, but see, really, what happens is uh, the minority carrier, which is an uh, electron in this region, right? Because in this region, the major, uh, majority electron, the hole is minority. In this region, the hole is majority and electron minority. So once it comes to this re other side, it becomes a minority. And the minority carrier, the electron, recombine with the hole, OK? And that's a recombination process. And so the whole supply is drawn to this region by because it's recombined with the minority electron. So the electron eventually approach equi a quasi equilibrium electron, the bulk region. So this, this recombination region, so you have a long equilibrium in the space charge, and then it's a recombination the drives the quasi Fermi level approaching each other on the dual sides. Okay? And with that, so the theory was worked out. So you can write the dial the equation. And uh, uh, let me write them down the dial the equation. I'm not deriving it, it's given in the book. So uh, J equals the dial equation, JS exponential. E V K B T minus one. Okay, and the voltage here, the this voltage difference, when between the electrochemical potential on the two sides, that's the apply the external apply voltage. Okay, and this J S is called saturation current, also dark current. Right, say so it can be written as an E uh, for this uh, very long uh, junction. Uh, say, uh, say this is the uh, conduction band. Uh, the uh, uh, when you write the uh, charge distribution, that's the uh, charge in the conduction band, and uh, here and the valence band, and this is the acceptor, and. Uh, the so dopant in the acceptor is in the p-type region, and the holes, the recombination time of holes, diffusivity, uh, A is D, so that's a diffusivity, and uh, this is the donor, and the diffusivity of the electron, and the uh, recombination time of the electron times Exponential, the band gap is the EG KBT. So this is the saturation current. Or 
or sometimes it's also called dark current, depends on whether you deal with solar cell or you deal with a diode. Okay? So if you look at the, uh, uh, this here is the exponential function, right? When we raise the voltage, basically that's because of the carrier concentration is exponential, that's the Fermi Dirac uh, distribution or Boltzmann distribution. Right, the carrier constraint depends exponentially on the uh, energy levels, and uh, here uh, the saturation current has an exponential dependence on band gap. Diffusivity faster uh, is larger. Recombination time, right, is on the denominator. Okay, so if you that's a Every electrical engineer knows that. And in fact, I say this is a, you can say it's a two terms. So one is the electron, the other is a hole. And of course, uh, in uh, actual device, uh, the current is continuous, right? And uh, uh, so if you draw, this is a continuous current. This is a J that goes through the device. And this is the interface. And it turns out that the electron current is roughly, this is a J, the space charge region, and this is recombination. So in this region, this is the N region, this is the P region, right? In this region, the electron was supplied because, uh, say, the recombination for holes. So this is a J electron, and uh, you can also have a similar complementary for, for holes. For hole, this is the hole current. So this is zero here. The two add together. Ah, it's not, not very well doing this. So the two add together should give you the total constant J. This is the whole. Right? So in the electron uh, n-type region, electron is the majority here. Space charge is just a zip through, and then recombine with the melodic carrier, recombine with the majority holes. So semiconductor, the pin junction, this is why people call it it's a melodic carrier device. It's very sensitive to recombination. So what it means, because it's a melodic carrier, it's very sensitive to recombination, you want the pure, very pure semiconductors. Okay. And uh, if you recall uh, previously, I commented thermoelectrics. Thermoelectrics don't have this melodic carrier. It's a majority carrier-based device. So it's less sensitive to recombination and that's why you know, I say we can use uh, some very low tech, like a bone mill, a lot of defects still works, although the efficiency is not as high. But say the pin junction, solar cells, you want the very pure material. Let's see. Because of recombination. So this is a, again, standard drawing in books. But the next, I'm going to tell you something that the most electrical engineer doesn't know. And this is a, is a pin junction a cooling or heating? Huh? Depends on what? Bias. bias. Uh, maybe. Yeah, it depends on bias, yes. But say, um, four bias. OK. Of course, you all know that semiconductor chips have a very severe heating problem, right? So the answer actually should be heated. But that's actually not the case, right? So if you look at when I have a forward bias and the electron going, so recall before I said that the C-back coefficient is the average energy of the charge relative to chemical potential, right? So in this region, the electron C back, 
smaller. And it comes to this region is larger. So for electron, it's actually pulling heat away from the junction. And same is for the holes. And then where is the heat generated? The generation, so in the space charge region, is actually cooling. And the generation is this recombination. When they recombine, they release that heat. So if you draw spatially, and what happens, this is space charge. And uh, it's actually uh, something like this. This is the this is a Q generated. Let's say heat generation. So cooling in the center, but of course that's only a few micron, right? And and there are more heat generated dumped immediate to that, and this heat reverse back quickly. So it's less cool, uh, say heating, but say. What happens physically is actually cooling in the junction. Okay, and whether you can take advantage of that, and there are in fact uh, some papers uh, trying to take advantage. You can design how you design internal cool device and uh, say lasers or uh, diodes. Okay, so this is a pin junction, right? Now what solar cell does? So solar cell, the basic equation is based on this, just to add one additional term. What happens is, now let's look at the solar cell. Right? And uh, I have, for example, I make a pin junction. By the way, pin junction is not absolutely necessary for solar cell. It's most of the diffusion, charge diffusion. OK, uh, not, uh, some solar cell like grass cell, there's no pin junction inside. OK, so what happens is this is my pin junction, right? I put it under the sun. And uh, the light will come and uh, get absorbed. So the way I make a pin junction is, uh, for example, this is a, a, a say, a P-type substrate and an N-type doping. I put a diffusion put it in contact with the phosphor and the phosphor diffuse, or I implant phosphor into the top layer, and then make a pin junction, right? So uh, now the light strikes the surface, and uh, uh, the energy with the lar uh, larger than the band gap will lift the electron from here to here. Of course, it can go from here to here, right? But then for simplicity, let me focus on the space charge region. So now I have a space charge. I go in from here. I lift, uh, say, here. That's the light strike or higher energy if the, bank, the energy of the uh, photon is larger than band gap. Now I got the access to the electron. Where do they go? They go here or they go here? Huh? Well, they go to lower energy first. <laughs> they tend to go to lower energy, right? So they will go here first. And when there are a lot more excess electron, an excess hole, the hole goes here, right? So effectively, you will raise the chemical potential here. You will say, so now I have a sort of a pin junction in forward condition bias. So what I have is a really combination of two process, right? I do have the situation I just draw, but say my charge comes from. So I have a, say one is a generation, the other is because of this generator, they create a forward voltage actually drive me the charge back, right? So that forward voltage driving back is this equation. A generation, I just uh, source a negative term. So my pn junction equation for under illumination <laughs> be 
becomes j equals js exponential ev kbt minus 1 minus j of the generation. This is the pair of electron holes. I say photons, you first you think of photons absorbed, and each photon generates one pair of electron hole. Right? And uh, say, uh, and that electron hole should ideally, I actually, I want to extract them out to this electrode. But once I have voltage generated, it will reverse back some. So I have the imbalance between the two. That's the lead current is what I want to extract. In, fa in fact, if you look at this, forward, your current should be going this way, right? That's a normal diode. If you want to make electricity, you better get the negative term out of this. That means uh, this direction is not balanced. This reverse I take out from the electrode, right? So that's the say, uh, 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 equation here. And uh, uh, if you draw this characteristics, right? And uh, this is a diode of now, say, uh, under, say, a normal diode. Okay? And this will be the one that you want out of, uh, you want out of, uh, say, um, uh, solar cell. This is the current, this is the voltage. Exponentially increase, and uh, it's in only in this region, negative current. I'm extracting useful work, right? So this is, a, say, you look at the uh, IV curve of a solar cell, you, are, you should look at this region, how large it is. So this is the, uh, at the zero voltage, I have JG, and I say at the zero current, I have VOC. That's an open circuit voltage, right, short circuit current. And uh, of course, the power is J times V, and you have maximize it, right? So you have to do your dW dV equals zero. There you get a V maximum, J maximum. And uh, you look at this, it's really the small square inside so if my maximum is here, that's the, that's, the, that's the power I'm actually getting, right? You ideally, you say, I want this voltage. I want this current. But they actually, unless this is a, a square, you don't get it. So people try to get as close to this square as possible. And the quantity they, they define that is the field factor. Okay. And F equals uh, J M V M. That's the maximum, and uh, J uh, G V O C. So that's the larger square outside what you dream to have versus the actual you can extract, right? And then most, so you look at this curve, sometimes people make a cell, they look like this. If you with your expert eye, you can tell what you should do. Internal resistance. Electrical resistance too large, so you have this IV resistance. That resistance come from. So you, you have different mechanism that can have so different sort of uh, say loss in the cell, and the, your game is trying to extract as much power as possible. Right? Then the question is, what's the maximum? What's the best I can do? Right? First, I say JG. I can say JG is the number of electron hole pair. I can say this is a JG 
is uh, let's say uh, electron and uh, from the sun to the earth that's a view factor right and this conversion of a phot photon you think about the photon from the sun dilute as you go larger radius it's a water fraction of the uh, say, uh, uh, say photon emitted fall into the earth and then say the absorption so let's say I do a, uh, say one mass r uh, omega it's a reflection that's assuming everything getting the photon the front surface is absorbed of course you could have transmission so you really need to maximize that absorption so this is a, this one you can also write as a omega absorption right and then if this is the solar spectrum sun which is the sun temperature as a function of omega and uh, that's the intensity I divide by h bar omega that's a Lambert flux right because that's the energy intensity I just want to count how many photons because the excess energy I can't capture the, I, unless I make a hot cell there and uh, this is d omega so this gives me how many electron hole pairs are generated in the cell so that gives me uh, you can always maximize let's suppose this is one that's the maximum number you can do right absorb all photon generated and of course you have to count only the photons with wavelengths larger than the band gap right if this is band gap divided by h bar that's the corresponding frequency to the gap band gap of semiconductor so this term you can easily calculate and uh, part of our research is actually on how I can maximize this absorption or minimize the material usage. That's related to your cost. The key is how I can, if I want to answer this question, what's my maximum? The question is, what's here? What's the minimum here? It turns out that you want this JS to be small. You go to do your math. So what's the minimum? And this is where, again, shockly, OK? And uh, uh, see, he developed this, uh, see, Shockley and Quasar limit. He say, even if here what we have is really, say, diffusion, recombination, Right, if you make a very perfect conductor, now say diffusion is very large, and uh, recombination, no defects inside, no long radiative recombination, but you still have to have the photon comes in, you have to have, you can't just uh, accumulate there. So there got to be the, 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 this number balance there, so it's say the radio the recombination actually gets you maximum. OK, so once you have, so what Shockley <laughs> say, OK, now you create an open circuit, right? And let's suppose I'm not connecting my cell. I have imbalance between electron hole. That's an EV. There's no voltage drop. There's no internal resistance. So EV is my balance in the quasi-Fermi level. So electron hole are allowed at equilibrium. And the photon emission, so this is what I said before. Normally, we say photon chemical potential is zero. And what Shockley written down, is if you have this dynamic equilibrium, right? Photon comes in, radial recombination. And uh, the photon emitted is E V, uh, say, is uh, H omega mass E V over K B T. Uh, say, let's say here I have uh, mass one. This is a photon, right? So normally, if there is no E V, that's the uh, say Bose-Einstein distribution. For photon, right? 
but Shockley added this EV. So photon now emitted as a chemical potential, right? You go to read Shockley equation. See, this is a Shockley equation. Uh, Shockley. I hope I'm writing everything right. Shockley quasar. Uh, okay. This one, you have to check the name. Maybe I'm spelling it wrong. Uh, this is Shockley quasar limit. And uh, the Shockley quasar paper, you go to read it. Uh, it's very difficult. <laughs> they did a ba detail balance argument. I don't think I read fully through that paper. Then I, I read many papers. And this is where really, uh, for many years, I was uh, always asking a student in the class, like, show me a better way <laughs> to derive it. OK? And uh, uh, there's another paper so by Henry. And this is uh, cited in the book. And you can read that JAP. There's another paper by Ross. Uh, uh, I forgot where it was. Uh, it was in chemistry journals. So the, 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 say then there was a, say, um, I think they, there's a paper by Wolfo, Peter Wolfo. Um, uh, those are some of the good papers and try to read and uh, really see how you can derive this thing. OK. And uh, so I spent actually quite a long time. And now I think uh, I'm roughly, I can give explanation. I'm still trying to look at my notes to my notebook. And uh, I didn't quite to figure out what I did. Uh, so I'll give you this half this story. You can go back to make up the rest. OK, so it turns out this one, you have to, my view is you have to, this is also uh, in Warfel's paper. You have to look at the electron. You have to look at photon as a combine, right? Because this electron recombine with the hole and generate photon. So uh, you can write the first the the uh, say thermodynamic laws. Let's say the electron energy, right? And uh, the energy equals dQ. dQ is T D uh, S E. Entropy, right? And the mass P dV and the plus mu E dN E. Right? So this is the first second law together for electrons. I'm going to also write the holes. P D S hole must P D V plus mu uh, hole D N hole. Right? So in a recombination process, I have my electron number reduced by one, hole number reduced by one. Right? And uh, say uh, so I sum up. So PV, I don't know how to deal with PV in semiconductor. Uh, so I dropped it. Uh, I'm still reading books, so I dropped this. OK? And the book to read is uh, uh, Landau Lifshitz. I was reading last night. Like I said, I always fall into sleep. OK. Now you do that. You get a D E plus D R. I should do whole. So T D S E plus S whole. And I said I dropped that. So, uh, uh, so this is a minus because when an electron and the whole recombine, D N is a negative one, right? So I have. So I have mass mu E plus mu H. And this is the energy EV. You have to, so here you have to look at the electron energy increase in this way, whole energy is increasing that way. 
and uh, you have to write the details. But uh, just to put, in fact, I was uh, debating whether it's a negative EV or positive EV. So my son has a problem, maybe. OK, like I said, that's why I say, I know I derived this before, but uh, just trying to look at my notes. And here, electron hole energy, right? The system, they decrease the energy by H omega, because they recombine. So I have a uh, uh, same probably, again, you have to look at this. You have to, so this is applying your thermodynamics. Your second law, your first law, you need to take your system and you need to say the sign, whether it's increasing or decreasing, right? Then the question is this, right? So here is if you take this and uh, you go to look at the electron photon interaction, does it generate, the, if you emit a photon, does it generate entropy? This is where, okay, I say I can, if I, gen, if I emit a photon, I have no entropy generation. If I do other stuff, so what I want, basically I'm arguing why this is a, you read, it's not a reading anywhere, okay, I'm just making this argument. Why this is the most efficient, really the recombination, right? And it's a process that doesn't generate entropy. So what I'm going to have is this is the entropy decrease because the electron hole loss. So I, I, say, I will say this is the equal to the photon entropy that's carried away, right? If you make a color engine, you don't want entropy generation. So this is the entropy of the photon carried away and the next step is you have to write what's the entropy. Well, because I need a distribution, what's the entropy and distribution function relation, right? And I wasn't assume a priori there's an equilibrium. So I went to uh, say, because I know this expression, but actually I wasn't quite sure whether it's valid for equilibrium or non-equilibrium. But then I say, Nanda's book clearly say this is general. So this is what that we have. So for a photon system or boson, right, the entropy of a boson is 1 plus f log 1 plus f and mass f log f. So if you use this relation, if I say 1, so you take a derivative 1 mode, this is summing up all modes, right? So I'm only taking derivative, I have one mode df dE, and you solve this equation, you get the shock equalizer, that expression. Okay? So this is the one that I finally feel comfortable to tell, because in the past I always ask a student to show me, because I read all this paper, I don't feel comfortable. But uh, maybe you can go to make up those details and convince yourself. It's, uh, so I'm still debating. I'm trying to, uh, in fact, this morning, this week, I have a program review on the solar PV program project I have with DOE. And then one of the questions I've been asking and I've been working through this few months myself is trying to say, what's the entropy generation process in the solar cell? Right? Because with that, you will get the maximum. With shockley quasar radiant recombination, and in fact, uh, you don't even need this uh, equation. You don't even need this equation. You just say, shockley quasar give me the voltage that balance the, uh, the incoming, the lead difference, it gives me the current that I can extract, and you find the maximum power. And this, is uh, say if you do all the math, you'll find out that at the end, this, uh, this typical curve of uh, here, the maximum efficiency for one single junction band solar cell, and this happened, this is the band gap of semiconductor, and this is about the 1.4, and the maximum here depends on which spectrum of the solar radiation you use, those numbers change. Shock requires at first assume it's a black body, right? 
and then say later on people take the real solar spectrum and redid the calculation. So those lambda is around 30% efficient. That's the called shock to Quasar limit. Okay? Any questions? So I told you half baked work. I was trying to find from my notes. Okay. You should be able to say the exam problem now. 